So continue what we started last time. I guess we stopped right here at this slide that we're talking about. So here we said that unit weight for concrete, normal weight concrete is gonna be 150 PCF. If it is not specified to you in one of the problems exam or the uh, project, please use 150. Otherwise use whatever is specified for you. And for the lightweight concrete, we say this gonna be ranging between 110, maybe 115 uh, pound per cubic foot. Now, uh, we stopped at this slide, we were talking about concrete properties and the meaning of the concrete strength. So there is a, a term here that we call the concrete strength, the compressive strength. And the symbol for it is called F prime C. F means the stress, C stands for concrete and prime usually is for compression. So let's make it like, like a deal here. Let's give you the nomenclature that we use. It's gonna be F prime C, which is a concrete strength. If you like to order concrete or if you like to buy concrete, you do it by this number here, the strength of the concrete. For example, you say, I'd like to order 3000 PSI concrete. So this number here is gonna be in PSI. All these numbers, they are all in PSI. Now, 5,000 PSI is the same as 5 KSI, it's the same thing. Usually when you work with concrete design, all the code equations, it is built on PCI units. So it's gonna be PSI. So it's gonna be pound and inch. So all the ACI equations, again, they are based on pound and inch. So we call PSI code, if you like, to call it this way. So if you bring a cylinder and you put it, you put it in the testing machine, like what we said last time, and then at certain points, it's gonna break. The highest point, this is what you call here the concrete strength. This gave you the highest point. So let's say, for example, we're gonna bring here 4,000 concrete. We're gonna put it in testing. And let's say that you have means or method, you have some instruments that is gonna make you able to measure the stress in the same time with the strain during testing. You start to apply some stress or some force, vertical force, on the cylinder. At the same time, you have some strain that you can measure it. Now, look what happened. At the beginning, you have some elastic performance. After that, it's gonna be plastic elastic, plastic elastic, or elastic plastic, if you like. And then it's gonna be reaching the maximum point. Let's say for the 4,000, it's gonna be reaching this point here. It's gonna be the maximum strength, right, at this point. And this is gonna be about, if you look here for all concrete, usually it's gonna be about 0 0.002 of strain. Okay, after that, the curve is gonna start to drop down and then at certain point, the concrete cylinder is gonna break. So usually the concrete is gonna break at the strain of maybe 0 0.0035 or maybe 0 0.04. When it comes to the strength, I really care about this point. So let's say this gonna be one of the typical stress strain relationship for the concrete. I'm gonna be interested in the highest point when it comes to the stress, the corresponding strain. So the two numbers I'm gonna be stressed here is gonna be the 4 KSI or 4,000 PSI. The strain, it happens at 0 0.002 and then the failure strain. So I'm gonna say 4,000 is gonna be failing here. So this is gonna be the number that I really care about, which is this number here. Let me put a box around it. It's gonna be right here. So for this point, as you see, I was interested in the strength and the strain. At this point, I'm not really interested in the strength. I don't really care about this one. I don't care about where it fails in terms of the stress, but I really care about this amount of strain that this concrete was able to reach. So as you see here, the range of the concrete, I understand that you can do concrete thousand PSI if you wanted to, or maybe 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000, maybe 6,000, maybe also 10,000. But what's common? What's the typical that you're gonna find out there in the market? You see the typical that you're gonna find there is gonna be ranging from 2,500 to 5,000 PSI. It doesn't mean that you cannot produce concrete of 2,000. It doesn't mean that you cannot produce concrete of 10,000. But this is gonna be the typical that you see there in the market. If it's gonna be below a certain value, you cannot really use it in our design, but you don't have an upper limit. You can go to any value. When it comes to the maximum strength, it doesn't matter. Now the code looks here at this straight strain curve and they say, here is what I care about. When it comes to failure, it's gonna be the amount of strain. 
And to be in the safe side, code-wise, I'm just going to be limiting here the concrete to a strain of 0.03. I know concrete is going to be failing at higher strain value, but for me, I'm going to say, you know what? Concrete is going to be failing at this point. And this is what the ACI says. It says here that the ultimate, the maximum ultimate concrete strain, it doesn't matter which strength that you're talking about, is going to be 0.03. So who decided on this? That was the ACI3 team. It's written in the code that maximum strain that concrete is going to be um, uh, allowed or is going to be reaching or approaching is going to be the 0.03. But we know that the concrete is going to be surviving for more strain. But we said for safety, I'm just going to be stopping it right here. About the strength, the, max, the, the ultimate strength here, which means when it wants to fail at the failure point, we say, well, we don't care. I'm going to show you why. Uh, maybe end of today, you'll figure this out. Now, this is kind of um, copy and paste, if you like, from the ACI, the ACI composed of chapters in this Gabby chapter 19, section two, so 19.2 about the concrete design properties. And the F prime C is a specified compressive strength. What does it mean by specified? Specified means when you do the design at the beginning, you need to come up with the value that you'd like to estimate and use in your analysis. And this value, this is what you call a specified because you're gonna specify it in your design. You're gonna put it in your drones, on the plans. You know, at the end, all your work is gonna be on plans and drones. So this is gonna be the value that you'd like to use and put it there. The actual value or the test value, it has to be higher than this value. Otherwise, I mean, you're not, Construction is not in good terms. This is not good. You ask for 3,000 PSI concrete, I guess maybe you'd like to see at least 3,000 PSI test value in the strength. Maybe 3,500, maybe 4,000, you're gonna be saying, okay. So we have two terms here, a specified and the test. So this gonna be the specified that the code says. The minimum is specified, as it says here, the limits. This gonna be the minimum values and the maximum values for F prime C. And what's F prime C again? is the concrete design properties, the compressive strength of the concrete F prime C. This is gonna be the test, this is gonna be the design values, which means the specified values. It says here you have two categories. This is general, which means that you have gravity members. Gravity members are those members supporting the load and life load. You have also seismic members. Seismic members is gonna be those members to resist earthquake forces. So I'm gonna say here's the second category. They call it here, they call it special mount frame and special structure walls. Now I understand the reason that they call it this way because these two structure members is gonna be resisting, let's say earthquake forces. Now for this general application, which means gravity loading, you're gonna have either normal with concrete or light with concrete, like what we discussed last time. And for both of these two concretes, you're gonna have a minimum 2,500 PSI. I'm gonna take you here back one slide. I'm gonna say, how about this one? When it's 2000, what should I do about it? You can say, yeah, you can produce 2000 concrete, but you cannot use it as a structure concrete. You cannot use the code equation. The code now in this case is gonna be the ACI equations. You cannot use it when the concrete strength becomes 2000 because it's gonna be just too low. So code would not let you use anything lower than 2500 PSI. Now, when it comes to the maximum strength, there is no limit. You can use any strengths you want. And this is for what? Gravity members. So let me write this here. Yes, say gravity members. What does it mean by members, concrete members, like what? I'm gonna say like concrete slab, like beams, like girders, like columns, like foundation, all of that. As long as you resist dead load and life load. Once you say they're gonna be resisting seismic forces, I'm gonna say here, this is gonna be for seismic forces. In this case, for this category, if you have normal weight concrete, you are gonna have minimum of 3000 and also light weight minimum of 3000. For the normal weight concrete, you don't have a max, but for the light weight concrete, you have a maximum of 5000. The only reason that this one here has a limit because there is no enough testing on seismic members. What, does, what are the seismic members? Like moment frames and shear walls to resist the seismic forces and they were made out of concrete was let's say 6,000. 
No one has tested them before. There's no enough testing. That's why they say, well, the maximum that we can let you use here, if you're going to have your lightweight concrete, is going to be 5,000. But you know what? This is not used in practice. So in practice, if you have size numbers, most likely it's going to be normal with concrete. And for the gravity, if you have reinforced concrete structure, most likely it's going to be normal with concrete. Lightweight concrete has, I'm going to say here, limited applications. Certain applications only you'd like to use them. And again, the only reason that you use lightweight concrete, and this also has been discussed last time, the only reason is to reduce the dead load of the building. When you reduce dead load, it means the load itself, the total design load is going to be less. What do I mean here by design loads? It means a load that you're going to be considering when you do your design. Now we have an idea that the ACI from time to time, they're going to put some new limits and restrictions on the way that we choose the concrete strength, right? Depends whether it's going to be normal weight, lightweight, whether it's going to be gravity members or seismic members. All right. If you like to use lightweight concrete, we have this factor, it's called lambda. This lambda depends on what type of lightweight you're going to be using. You remember last time I said that we have two components for the aggregate. We have coarse aggregate, which is like rock or gravel, and also we have fine aggregate, and fine aggregate is going to be the same in this case. You can have lightweight coarse aggregate, and you can have also lightweight fine aggregate which means lightweight rock and lightweight sand. So what you can do in your design mix, you can come say, and, they, and then you can say, I'd like to have lightweight of both, lightweight sand, lightweight rock. It's fine, just use them together. Or you may say, well, I'd like to go only with lightweight rock and the sand is gonna be normal weight or lightweight sand and the rock is gonna be normal weight. You can have any combinations and the code recognizes. It says here, all lightweight. So what does it mean by all lightweight? It means, the coarse aggregate is going to be lightweight and the fine aggregate is going to be lightweight. And in this case, this is going to be a factor. You're going to see what is this reduction factor is going to be used for. We're not going to be addressing it today, but later on, I want you here to know that all of a sudden we're going to have this lambda factor. I'm going to say, this is the lightweight factor that we have been discussing, right? That we discussed in the past. Now here it comes. It's going to come here into this picture. So for all lightweight, you're using here a factor of 0.75. If you have Lightweight fine blend, which means the sand is going to be 0 0.75, 0 0.85, depends. Sand lightweight only is going to be 0.85. Sand lightweight coarse blend is going to be 0.85 to 1. Normal weight, there is no reduction. How about in our design? And if I'm practicing here, if I'm doing engineering, what should I do? What should I do? I'm going to say if this is going to be normal weight, just use one, which means don't use this factor. Just take it out of the picture. If someone said here, we are planning to use lightweight, just use a 0.75. Don't try to go somewhere in between. Just use a 0.75, just to be safe. Because most likely they're gonna bring here lightweight concrete and lightweight, uh, lightweight aggregate, both of sand and rock. They're gonna be going with this. So if someone says here, lightweight concrete, just use this. Without thinking about, let's say going to 0.85, it is not worth it because later on during construction, they're going to change it and eventually they're going to be using all lightweight uh, aggregate and all lightweight concrete. Any questions? Questions before we move forward? No. Okay, thank you. All right, now let's talk about the reinforcing bars. We call it also steam. So you guys, you know, when I'm talking here about steel, the steel can be this like W section, like the I beams and also can be reinforcing bars. Let me show you a picture here of the steel. This is gonna be like the rebars, right? The standard rebars that you look at. In some cases, the rebar itself is smooth. It doesn't have any of this deformation. We call this deformation or the reps. You see this reps? Some cases we have some rebars that's completely smooth, but we don't like to use them in concrete. You'd like to use this in concrete because this deformation here is gonna be providing the bond between the concrete and the reinforcing bars. You can call it reinforcing steel, you can call it rebars. I mean, it's gonna be up to you. You can call it reinforcing bars, 
there's more than one way to address it. Very common that we just call it three bars. Three bars means reinforcing and bars, we just add them together to form this expression. So the rebar here, it comes into size. You have different sizes. So um, let's say um, like half inch, three eighths of an inch, like seven eighths of an inch, like an inch rebar. So it depends on the damper, right? And what we care about is gonna be the damper and the cross section area of this rebar. This rebar, it comes into two categories, if you like. There's two ASTM numbers, and we discussed last time the meaning of the ASTM, the standard of the ASTM. It's gonna be either A615 or A706, one of these two. This is what you're gonna see in the market. Most likely it's gonna be this guy. So I'm gonna say this is gonna be the one that you're gonna see out there, 615. So what does it mean by 615? 615 means it is a rebar. If you like to say that this is a piece of rebar that complies with the A615, it means that if you do the testing, chemical testing, mechanical testing, all the properties, the shapes, the all of the letters here written on it and the whole thing here is gonna be complying with the ASTM A615 standards. And generally speaking, it comes here, this A615 comes in three grades. What do I mean by grade? Grade means the strength. So what is the grade or the strength? The grade or the strength is gonna be this F sub Y, the yield stress. So this chart here, it shows the stress versus the strain for a test spacement. So I'm gonna bring here a piece of rebar. The test length is gonna be eight inches. We're gonna put it in the test machine. We're gonna apply tension. And as you apply tension, it means that you're applying the stress. Right? In the same time, you measure the strain. You apply stress, you measure strain. At the beginning, you have this elastic performance. You see from here to there, you have this elastic performance. Right? You have this linear relationship. At certain point, the machine is not gonna be able to put any force. And you're gonna see here, you have loss of extension in the rebar. We call this gonna be the yield plateau, or this is gonna be the yield region, right? The rebar here is gonna be yielding, which means not resisting, right? It's just showing lots of extension. And then all of a sudden, the rebar or the machine is gonna to start to see some resistance from the rebar, which is this point here. You can see at this point here, that we call the strain hardening, the machine is gonna to start to resist some forces. So, okay. So what's gonna happen after this? Now the stress strain diagram is gonna be going up because the machine here is loading, right? It shows some resistance. It's gonna come here to a point. After that, it's gonna decline a little bit and then fails. Now, if you are doing a design, a concrete design, very similar to what we discussed on the concrete stress strain relationship. I'm gonna stop here for a second. I'm gonna go back and show you the stress strain diagram that I was just talking about just to confirm. We say for the maximum uh, point, I'm gonna be interested in the strength and the strain. And for the last point, which means the failure point, which is in this case, according to the code, this is gonna be the point 0.03, I'm gonna be interested only in the strain. I don't really care about the stress. So out of this stress strain diagram for the concrete, I'm interested in three values. Strength, maximum strength, corresponding strain, and the failure strain which is a 0.03 by code. Now, how about here for the steam? You can see the first point I'm interested in is gonna be this F sub Y, the yield strength. And the strain that goes with it, you can see and this value also. I don't really care about the strain hardening, but I'm happy when you see the strain hardening is happening. So for example, if this reinforcing bar is showing flat performance like this, you're not gonna be happy. Why? Because it means once it hits the yield strain, you're gonna have infinite strain and extension and formation that you cannot really stop it, which means the beam is collapsing. You don't want this to happen. 
you want it to start to pick up again some forces after certain time. But we don't really care about this F sub u, which is all. It's not important to us. So I'm going to put boxes here around the values that I'm interested in. This is going to be the yield stress, yield strain. And also, I'm going to be interested in this value because this value also is critical. How is that? If you like your steel, the three bar spacement that you have, to be called A615, you need to have this maximum strain to happen, which is going to be a lot compared to the yield strain. So someone's gonna say, what do you call this value here? I mean, when it comes to steel, I'm gonna say, this is what you call the grade of the steel. So this value, if I have here grade 40, you see this grade 40, it means F sub y equals 40 KSI. If I have grade 60, it's gonna be six KSI. If I have grade 75, it's gonna be 75 KSI. It's exactly what we say here. Typically in the trend, it's gonna be this, which means for this one, I'm gonna call it here what? I'm gonna call it here grade 40. And this one is going to be grade 60. This one is going to be grade 75. Now, which one is typical? Which one is common, very common that you're going to see in the market? The very common one is going to be the grade 60. So I'm going to put box around this grade 60 so that you guys know. So if no one mentioned anything about the yield strength, you can just use 20, uh, 60. KSI for the steel yield strength. One more value I'm going to be interested in, which is this ES. ES is going to be like the youngest models. You remember, guys, the models velocity, ES? So what is ES equals to? ES is going to be the slope of this line, which means it's going to be equal to the Y component divided by the X component. Y component meaning what? Stress. X component meaning what? Strain. What the stress units do you want to use here? This is going to be the question. I'm going to say the ACI is a PSI code, which means everything here needs to be in PSI. I understand. But you know what? Sometimes also we use KSI. But if it comes to an equation, you have to use PSI, like what I have discussed here. For concrete, I said it's going to be PSI. But from time to time, I can just call it for KSI, but once I come to an equation, I need to use it in PSI. I need to do the conversion. All the code equations are built on PSI system. It's gonna be pound and inch. Can I move forward here again to this? So you can say, now I understand. This one also is gonna be in PSI. How about the strain units? Anyone can let me know about this is strain units? What strain units would you guys use these days? What does it mean by that, Eddie? Yeah. Unitless, exactly. There is no units for the strain. How about ES? This model is, what units would I have for ES? So ES is gonna be in what? ES is equal to what? Stress divided by strain, and the strain is unitless. So it's gonna be the same as a stress units. It's gonna be in PSI or KSI. Anyone knows the steel ES, the value for it, like the common value for the model's velocity? Like what's the standard value? You guys know it? Typical ES is equal to how much? Yeah, Venus, thank you. And, and please feel free to turn on your mic and speak. Thank you, Venus. So it's gonna be 29. Thousand, as she said here. Twenty-nine thousand what? KSI or PSI? Okay, I see here answers. Everybody says KSI, KSI. Very good. All right. So actually, it's gonna be in KSI. So I got to be careful because if someone here is gonna say, "How much is this yield strain?" So let's say this is epsilon. I'm just gonna use the symbol here E for epsilon, right? And this is actually, if you go to Word and look for the font, the E is going to give you this epsilon, right? Once you put it in symbol format. So once you put in the correct format. So how much is this ES? How can I find out the strain? The strain at the yield point. I'm going to say, here's my understanding. All right. ES equals 
Fy divided by Es, correct? This is gonna be the lowercase Es, which is a strain. Therefore, the lowercase Es, which is a strain equals, equals what? Can someone help me? Fy divided by Es. What is F sub Y? Standard typical, how much is this? 60. Now, should I say 60,000? Yeah, if you like, but this is now it's gonna be in PSI. So let's just make it in KSI for now. As long as you keep an eye open and you're careful about units, you should be fine. So you can say 60 divided by 29,000. How much is this? Can someone help me here? How much is this? Yes. Point zero zero two. Very good. Thank you, Sam. Excellent. All right. So this gave me the strain at what point? At the end point. Okay. Good. Makes sense. This is very good. How about for grade seventy five? What's grade seventy five? What do you mean by grade? Oh, grade seventy five means the yield stress is gonna be seventy five. So I'm gonna say okay. E S. For this grade, it's gonna be 75 divided by 29,000. How much is this? 0, 0, 0, 6. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. Excellent. Very good. I say good. Now I know how much strain is gonna happen here when the concrete is gonna, when the steel is gonna start to yield. I want you to look at this. Remember this value, 0. 0.002. This is when the steel is gonna start to you, right? Look at the concrete properties. What happened at 0.02 at the same strain level? The concrete is reaching its maximum value. So when the steel is gonna start, right? In the reinforcing bars, concrete also is gonna be right at the peak point, at the maximum point, which is just happened. All right, so let's move forward. We are done here with discussing the reinforcing bars. Now, this reinforcing bars, since it's going to meet here or conforms with the STM A615, it comes in size. We call this going to be the rebar size. This rebar size and this table is going to be provided to you. If you are doing a homework, go ahead and use it, of course. If it's going to be a quiz, it's going to be there. Midterm is going to be there. Final also is going to be there. So you're going to have it. So once you have here the rebar size, you know the nominal diameter, which means approximate diameter of the rebar. As you see here, for number eight, how big is number eight? It says here one inch. Here's the diameter, right? How about number four, it's half inch? As if all of these numbers in terms of eighth of an inch. So if I'm gonna go here to number five, what does it mean by number five? Five eighth of an inch. Six eighth of an inch, like three quarter of an inch. Yeah, 0.25. So it makes sense. This gave in terms of eighth of an inch. Now I understand what is this number come from. Here's the nominal diameter, which means approximate diameter. It's not exact. And this gave you the cross section area of the rebar. So for example, uh, number nine rebar, here's the diameter for it. And it has cross section area of one square inches. Now, I don't want you to do pi r squared or pi d squared divided by four to find out the cross section area of the rebar. You cannot do it this way. If you do it this way, you may be losing points. I want you guys to know about this because you're not gonna be getting exactly the same value like here. You have to use these values from this table. If you try to say, well, I don't have the table handy, you cannot, I mean, you cannot work without this table. You need to have it. After a certain number of times of using this and working in concrete design, you just memorize these values easily. But for now, let's say it's gonna be provided to you and please do not do pi d squared over four or pi r squared to find out the cross section area. Don't use an equation. You need to look it up from this table. Any questions? Yes? All right, again, if you are trying to find out the cross-section area of a rebar, use this table, please. You need to use this table, okay? All right. Now, uh, as I said in the beginning, 
that I have uh, a few slide sets that I put it from an old course, which is mechanics of materials, because we'd like to discuss a beam bending and this kind of things. And they put some already on canvas, so you should have an access to. First slide set, beam bending. Of course, I'm not going to go in details, but I'm just going to uh, walk you guys through it. Like here's the beam, like a standard beam. Uh, the simply supported meaning that I'm going to have here a hinge and here's going to be a roller. This is going to be like a cantilever system. And this is going to be a cantilever, right? Which is this piece on overhang with a back span. This is going to be a roller and this is going to be a hinge. Uh, number of equations, number of unknowns. You know this is going to be indeterminate and this is going to be determinate. Uh, we are not teaching here. Uh, I'm going to say structure analysis course. So most likely I'm going to see here determine the structure. It's going to be the simply supported ones. This is, if you like to draw here the bending moment diagram and you need to understand what does mean by positive shear, negative shear and about positive moment and negative moment. This is going to be very important for us. Positive moment means the tension is going to be at the bottom. You see when you are bending the beam this way, now where the tension is going to happen, as you see here, tension is going to happen in this location, right? Tension is going to be here at the bottom, right? Which means right here. It will never happen at the top in this case because the way that we apply the bending, right? So tension is going to be here at the bottom. Negative moment means tension is going to be in the top. So I really care about the tension when it comes to concrete. Concrete is very strong when it comes to compression. It can take lots of compression. But once it comes to tension, it's going to be very weak. It's going to start to crack. So usually cracking happens in concrete because of tension. So if concrete is going to be weak in tension, how can I use it as a beam? Concrete is not going to be able to take any tension. So your only chance is that you're going to provide reinforcing bars because steel is very good in tension and compression. So never to come to tension, I'm going to put the steel reinforcing bars. Whenever to come to compression, I may just leave the concrete to resist this compression. And from time to time, I may add also some reinforcing bars. Here is one beam. And you guys, you have seen this already, right? Have you? Yes? Yes. OK, yes. good. So you have the answer to it. Here's the way to do it. But now you need to do also the mom diagram and the shear diagram. Another beam here. Very simply, this is going to be a simply supported beam. And then you need to know how to do the building moment diagram for it, how to do the values for it. So you guys can study this. Here is the shear diagram, and here is the building moment diagram for simply supported beam. And you see the maximum moments going to be W squared divided by eight. It's going to be very important values that you guys from time to time you are going to be using it. You know, when you have a different beam, if you like, now this beam here is going to be a hinge and a roller. Then you have some concentrated moment here, point load, uniform load. You have also the way to solve it. How do you find first the reactions? And then eventually how to draw the bending moment diagram, All right? So you guys will go through this and read it before you finish your homework. All right, second slide set. But the stress and beam. We call this flexure. Flexure is the same as moment, like bending. Flexure means like bending. This is the exact meaning of it, if you like. So here's the beam section, and they give you some irregular shape, not rectangular shape, because they'd like you to develop the equation for it. So if you like to develop some equations, usually they give you some irregular shape. And the moment is going to be coming this way. We call this positive moment. Why positive moment? Because tensions give you at the bottom. And compression is giving the top. And this can be the axis of the beam. All right. You see what happened when you apply the moment this way? Tension is giving at the bottom, compression at the top. We call this passive moment, right? So here's before deformation. Once you start to apply the moment, tension is giving the bottom. And look what compression is going to be doing to the beam section itself. And as it says here, passive moment, right? Tension at the bottom fibers of beam. Look here at this beam here. We start to push it up. This is what you call here negative moment. Look what happened. Tension here is going to be at the bottom. 
and compression is giving the top. And this is giving like a very small slice of it. Look at half to this distance before you apply any moment. This delta X with the same in the top and bottom. But after you apply this moment, look what happened here on the top. It's getting smaller and the bottom is getting larger. Why larger? Because you apply tension on it. And the top is giving compression. It's going to get small. Um, you'll end up with this stress distribution, if you like. This give be the stress distribution due to bending or flexure. And this stress in the top is going to be negative, meaning compression, and the bottom is going to be tension, right? So usually, when it comes to compression, we call it negative. And at one point, we're going to stop doing it in concrete design. Because when it comes to columns, all columns are exposed to compression. So instead of showing usually negative value, we just say it's going to be positive value. And we are going to say next to it, compression. So we understand why we're doing this. Look at this distribution here. Right at this point here, this is what you call neutral axis. The bottom is going to be tension, and the top is going to be compression, right? Maximum stress is giving the top, whether it's going to be compression, right? And maximum tension is going to be all the way at the bottom. Right at this point here, we're going to call it zero stress. And this point is called, I'm going to put it right next to it. This point is called neutral axis, like this, usually. Look at this equation here. This equation is going to be based on this two triangles that you have this uh, symmetry because of these triangles, right? So if you take this epsilon, which is this amount of a strain, which is right here, look at this. The strain, which is this value here, this ordinate, right? And you'd like to relate it to this maximum stress, correct? This is going to be the maximum stress that you're going to have here, absolute max. I'm going to say, let me put it right here because this is where it goes straight at Y. So you are going to have your two triangles that are similar to each other. So you can simply say this epsilon, which is the strain that you're interested in, divided by epsilon max is going to be equal to Y divided by C. So what is C? C is what we call here depth of neutral axis. I'm going to write it here, depth of neutral axis. From where? From the compression fibers, the top compression fibers. So you cannot come here and call the C from here to there because this is going to be the tension side, it's going to be compression side. So I'm going to say in this side here, I'm going to have compression. And in this side here, I'm going to have tension. All right. So now I understand the depth C usually is going to be made from compression. And Y is going to be the distance from the neutral axis to any point you're interested in. So if you like go here to this point, you're going to call this Y. If you like to go to another point here, you still can call it Y because this Y is going to be like your variable. You can play with it. And look at this relationship. Epsilon, which is a strain divided by epsilon max equal to Y divided by C. Yeah. If you take this epsilon divided by Y or epsilon divided by epsilon max, you can bring this here. Epsilon y by epsilon max is going to be equal to y over c. So why do we have this negative? This is going to be a negative sign, right? To indicate that you're going to have compression here. So that if you use this equation, you're going to end up with negative sign for this strain because also it's going to be in compression. This is the only reason. Now, how do you come up with the maximum stress? This is going to be the question, right? We need to see an equation for it. You can say, here's another example, right? just to entertain the idea, here's Y, here's the strain, the strain max, this is going to be C, and this is going to be Y, same thing, nothing is different here. And of course, it's going to be compression, it's going to be tension, right? I'm going to say, here's the equation. I'm not going to go here through driving this equation, but I'm going to say the maximum stress is going to be equal to what? The maximum stress, where does it happen? It's going to happen on the top. Maximum stress is going to be here. It have to do the maximum strain. Maximum stress is going to be equal to the moment. What moment? Applied moment, like bending moment, divided by moment of inertia. It says here moment of inertia of the section about the neutral axis. What do you mean by about the neutral? Here's the neutral axis, right? This is going to be the neutral axis. Let me do it here in red. Right? Neutral axis. So you do here the moment of inertia about this line here, right? And then multiply by C. What is C? 
C is going to be the distance from the top compression all the way to the neutral axis. So I guess this is very clear, right? I understand what is C, what is Y, and what is this neutral axis? We understand it. Also, what is M? M is going to be the applied bending moment. And what is I? It's going to be the moment of inertia. And we have here definition for all of them. Okay. This here is going to be the maximum stress. It's going to happen all the way in the top. How about the stress at any point? It's going to be equal to M times Y divided by I. Very similar to this equation. Difference is instead of C, I'm using here Y. And Y is going to be your variable, right? So Y is going to be at any point. Interested in the stress, right? At this level, it's going to be a little bit less. How do you find that out? Instead of using C, use Y. And you can play with the Y value here from zero all the way to the top. If you go with y equal to zero, the stress is going to be equal to zero, which is true. At this line here, the stress and the strain is going to be equal to zero. Okay. Here's one example about wood beam. Uh, wood beam section. And then they ask you using the flexure formula. What is the flexure formula? This is the flexure formula. Just so you know. What do you call this? Again, please remember. It's called flexure formula. Because when it comes to concrete design, I'm going to be just saying we're going to be using the Flexure formula. So you guys know which one we're talking about. And then it says here, find, find the stresses, right? Determine the internal moment at the section caused by stress distribution. So how much is the stress here? It says 2 KSI. Okay. And the depth, total depth of the beam, 12 inches. Neutral axis give you at 6 inch. Why? Because this beam is symmetrical. It is a simple section. And the width, as it says here, six inches. So it says here, and instead of giving you the moment and ask you for the stress, look at this. Usually they give you the moment and then you ask you for the stress. Instead of that, they give you the maximum stress and they ask you here for the moment. So I'm gonna go back here one slide. So they give you the stress, they ask for this moment. So they're gonna say, well, the moment is gonna be equal to the stress multiplied by moment of inertia divided by C. I can do it this way, which means I can use here the flexure formula. This is what I mean by the flexure formula. So let's see here how this can get done. Here's a beam section, six by 12. Here's the equation. Maximum stress is two KSI. How much is the C value here? I'm looking at this. See, I'm gonna say C is gonna be equal to six inches. So this is gonna be my C value, right? This is gonna be this six inches. Top compression to the neutral axis. How about the moment of inertia? You see, yeah, I have this equation. I remember this equation. BH cubed divided by 12. What is B that's width? The depth, what is H? Is gonna be 12 inches, right? BH cubed divided by 12 is gonna be 864 inches of force. Also be careful about units here. And look at this problem here. Everything is gonna be in kip inches. It's okay to have it in kip inch or in pound inch, but be consistent. But once come to concrete design, it has to be in pound and inch only. So here's the moment of inertia. We're able to find it from this equation. Now let's use here this equation. It says maximum stress M times C divided by I, like in here, right? M C divided by I. Here's the moment, right? Multiply by C, which is six inches, divided by I. It's gonna be equal to two k per inch squared. It says here two k sign. M is going to be your unknown. And here's the M value. It's going to be 288 kip inch. At the end, some people would like to look at the moment and they'd like to see it as in kip foot. So what does he do? They convert kip inches into kip foot. How does he do it? I need help. Does he divide or multiply by 12? Divide or... Absolutely, yeah. Thank you for the response. They're gonna do fine. All right, so now we understand the stress equation here, the, the, the flexure formula and how to use it, right? And also there's another method which is called here, if you wanna look at this, they call find the resultant of the stress distribution. Now you need to understand when you have normal stress because all of this we call normal stress. Normal stress can be just uniform, which means the same at all points, or it can be like gradient distribution, like this distribution, right? 
If you like to do this integration to find out the resultant force, so I was gonna say integration. Yes, we call it integration. Finding out the volume or finding out an area under the curve, we call this integration process, right? So we can do here integration to find out the resultant force. So in here, I have some stress causing compression, meaning I'm expecting compression force to be right here and the tension force to be right here, right? Because look at the stress direction. This one, I'm gonna call it here C. This one, I'm gonna call it T. Why C? C stands for compression. And this C is gonna be stands for tension. How about this C lowercase? Oh, this is C uppercase. It's not lowercase, right? So once you put this and you put it as an uppercase, it means a force. If you put it lowercase, it's gonna be a distance, like in here. It's gonna be C lowercase, but uppercase means a force. So what do you do after this? I mean, how would you do integration? I say this is simple because integration means a volume of this is gonna be the same as a force. So this C, the compression force equals two KSI, apply by the depth, six inches. Of course, this is gonna be one half the depth, depth of this triangle, divide by two. This is gonna give me the area of this triangle, right? And then multiply by six inches, which is the width. It's gonna give you here the compression force. Are you guys with me? Any questions? Finding out this force? Yes? Um, could you repeat it one more time, please? Okay, this force here. How do you find out this force, right? This force is going to be equal to the volume of this prism, of this triangular prism, right? So we're going to say the force C equals what? The volume of this guy here, right? Only the part in compression. So how do you find out the volume of this? So we're going to say it's going to be equal to 2. What is 2? It's going to be the height of this guy, right? Apply by the depth, divide by 2 to give you the area of this triangle, correct? So we're going to say 2 times 6 divided by 2. This gave you the area of the triangle. So what do you do after that? You're interested in the volume. We're going to say, let's here multiply by 6. What is the 6? It's going to be the width of this guy. With that, I'm going to have the total compression force. Can someone help me with this? Yes? It's going to be 36 kips. Am I correct? Yes. This is going to be 2. It's going to get canceled with 2. How about the tension force? Isn't it the same or any difference in here? Do you expect any difference? No, because it's symmetrical. Yeah, exactly. So C here is gonna be equal. I can say here C equals, if you like, T, which is a tension, equals to this 36 caps. How about the point of application of this force? Where does it happen? Does it happen at three inches from the top? You're going to say, no, because most of the force is given the top. It's given the centroid of this triangle, correct? Where's the centroid of this triangle? You're going to say it happens at one third of this height. So it happened at two inches from the top, four inches from the bottom here. Same thing here, four inches this way and two inches from here. So um, here's the two forces, right? We usually, in concrete, we call this C, and instead of negative F, we call this C, and then we call this what? Tension force. Here's gonna be the two forces. You see where it's gonna be located at? Two thirds from the top of this triangle, from the tip of it, and two inches from the base of it, because six minus four is gonna be two inches. So from the base of this triangle to the point load is gonna be two inches. Same thing from here. Meaning the distance from the tension to compression is how much? You say tension to compression is going to be the addition of these two values. It's going to be eight inches. I said, okay. Now, this can drive me here through this. Now, this can be leading me to do this. Here's the force value. How do you find out the force value? Here's the same equation I've just written, 36 kips. How about the moment? When you have two forces equal to each other, opposite to each other, yeah? We call this a couple. And the distance between the two forces gonna be eight inches. How much is the moment in this case? You say moment of a cobble is gonna be equal to one of these forces multiplied by the distance between them. 36 times eight inches. So if you have been given here one force this way and one force this way, right? 
And this force, I'm gonna be calling it here, let's say F, which is the same force as this one here, right? Yes. And the distance, you can say, you know what? The distance, I'm gonna call it X. Which distance? Perpendicular distance. If you remember this uh, term, when you say the distance between the two, is gonna be called X. How much is the moment here? You see the moment equals F times X. And what is X? The moment R. Moment R is gonna be the perpendicular distance from the first to the second force, which is here. The force is called F and the distance is gonna be eight inches. This is why you see here this eight inches and the 36 is gonna be the value of one of these two forces. And this is how we find out the moment based on what you call this resultant force, if you like. I'm gonna take you back here a couple of slides just to confirm this. The first method here is called the flexion formula. You see this? Second method says using or find the resultant of the stress distribution using the basic principles to find out the forces, find out the moment this way. Now, do you think I'm gonna have two different values if I run it uh, using both of these methods? Look at the first one, 288 kip inch, right? If you do the stress distribution. If you do the forced method, it's gonna be same value. So it's not gonna change. You're gonna end up exactly with the same value. Yes, any questions? It is your chance to ask me questions here. I can repeat any section if you guys want to. Anyone? Okay, great. Um, here is a simply supported beam. This is like the steel beam, the W section or the I beam that we were talking about. And in this exercise here, they're asking you to find the stresses at this point and at that point, right? And at that another point. So you find here the moment and then you find the stresses and you guys you should be able to go through it. So I'm gonna leave this here for you for, to, for you to study. Okay. The last slide said that we don't really need right now at the moment. Just I have an idea. This one here, when you have combined loading, so look here at this tool and look what happened. It's like a steel saw, right? So once you put the steel saw here, you're gonna start to apply some tension because once you start to tighten it, it's gonna apply tension in the blade, right? This is going to be creating here some moment because you are doing here some moment. And at the same time, also, you are going to have compression. So now you have combined forces. You don't have just bending. You have bending and some compression. So usually you're going to have bending and compression or bending and tension. And here's the equation for just compression or tension. The stress is going to be equal to the force divided by the cross-section area, like what happened here, right? Now you apply also this to it. So you're gonna have your combination of the normal force or axial force plus the bending moment on it. I'm not gonna be going through this now, but I let you guys to study it because I don't really read it now, but I'll need it in a few weeks from now. But I want you guys to read this and go through it before we go back to it. Okay. Now, as I said here, concrete usually cracks. I mean, why it's gonna crack? Because it's gonna be exposed to some tension. Here's the second slide set, it says number two, and then it's gonna be saying uncracked concrete. So what is uncracked concrete? What is a cracked concrete? Concrete is gonna crack once it's gonna be reaching certain tensile stress. So I'm gonna say, if you apply, let's say 50 PSI as a tension on the concrete, do you expect any cracks? I'm gonna say no, 50 is low. So what's gonna be a good number? I'm guessing maybe 300, 400 PSI. So once you apply 300 PSI or maybe 400 PSI in a concrete, the concrete is gonna start to crank. How would you apply it when it comes to tension? I'm gonna say, this is simple. 
either that you're going to have, let's say here's a concrete member, you're going to apply direct tension to it. If you apply direct tension to it, I'm going to say, okay, now let me look here at the amount of tensile stress that you put, which is equal to the force divided by the cross-section area of the concrete member. And let's look here at the stress value that you're able to reach. At the beginning, I was able to reach, let's say, 100 psi below the cracking, which means no cracking. This is good. I know now this concrete, I know it's going to crack at 300. How do I know it? Because the code says so. Why would the code say this? Because the code, after loss of testing, they put equations and then they put in the code and they say that the concrete is going to be cracking at certain point. Is this the only method of applying tension? Is there any other method of applying tension plus or besides the fact that they can apply tension like this? Yes? Like to hear from you guys. Don't feel shy to turn on your mic and speak. Yeah, you're gonna see a different slide. Absolutely, Oscar. <laughs> but I want to ask you first. I was just talking about something like this. How do you apply tension to a structure member? Does it have to be direct tension? Can't it be by bending as well? Exactly. I was just talking about it here. Didn't we say that here you're going to have tension and here is going to be tension compression? Which means this tensile stresses, I can do it in two ways, I can apply direct tension or just apply some moment. And actually, when you have a beam, it's gonna be most likely it's gonna be moment. Excellent, it's gonna be very small. You can just disregard it, you can ignore it. So actually in beams, you're gonna have tension and compression, right? Here's a beam, you apply some moment, and then tension is gonna be at the bottom. This here, what we call curvature. Maybe if you have taken uh, advanced structure analysis, you should have been taking this. Or maybe if you are taking uh, like advanced, uh, uh, like differential equations and stuff like this, you're gonna be seeing equations like this, right? So the curvature, you know, when you bend this beam here, it's gonna have a kind of a radius, right? Radius of bending. And this radius, I'm gonna call it rho. The inverse of this rho is what we call here the curvature. So Y is going to be the deflection, deflection of the beam, differentiated twice. It's going to give you here one over rho, which means a curvature, which is also called what? Phi. So we use also the simple phi for it. So here's a standard beam. And in this beam here, the width is usually called B. Total depth is called H. The depth to the reinforcing bars is called D, which is very critical. You cannot, you cannot switch them. You got to be very careful. Depth to the center of the reinforcing bars. You see this gave you the center of the reinforcing bars. Let me draw here a line. You see this? It's called D. Total depth is called H. Now, again, you're going to bring here a concrete beam. You're going to put some reinforcing bars. You're going to start to put some loads. Let's just assume for a second that the load is extremely small. You have very small load. So what's gonna happen? Excuse me for that. What's gonna happen if you put very small load? You see the beam is gonna start to see some tensile stresses here and some compressive stresses here. And let's say at certain point, the tensile stress was equal to 50 psi, compressive stress was equal also to 50 psi. So we're still at the beginning, early stage of loading. Now, do you expect to see any cracking at 50 psi? according to what I have just discussed a few minutes ago, I'm gonna say, don't think so. No, it's not gonna happen. Why? Because concrete is gonna be in good shape. No cracking yet. I'm gonna add a little bit of loads. Expect more deflection, expect more tensile stress and more compressive stress. To a certain point, at this point, the concrete is gonna start to crack. So the question is, what is that stress? that the code says that the concrete is gonna to start to crack on it. So code says concrete is gonna to start to crack once the stress in the tension is gonna be reaching this value here. 
So once the concrete is going to be approaching 7.5 is root of V prime C, intention, you will consider it to be cranked. So, okay, what is this F prime C? You know, it knows F prime C? Have you guys seen it? Yes? What is this F prime C? Concrete strength. Concrete strength. Concrete compression strength. What units should I use here? If this gonna be 4 KSI, should I say four square root of four or square root of 4,000? Uh, square root of 4,000. 4,000, why? Because this is a PSI code, right? Everything needs to be in PSI. This why it's gonna be critical because you cannot just say 1,000 square root of four is gonna be equal to square root of 4,000, right? Two different values. So you can, you can just do big mistakes if you just not be careful on the use of a prime C and the use of a stress units. So, okay. For 4,000, 7.5, how much is stress you think in tension the concrete is going to be cracked at? Can someone help me with this? Run this equation for quick. Is it 474.34? Uh... Great. All right. Let's say for now 475, just for sake of discussion, right? So I'm gonna say it means as long as the stress on the bottom is gonna be lower than 475, this concrete is gonna be in good shape, no cracks, correct? And the same stress value is gonna be in the top. Once you go beyond 475, concrete is gonna start to crack. And in this case, the steel is gonna start to work because before the concrete cracks, steel is not working. It's just sitting there, which means before cracking, this is still is doing nothing. It's just sitting there in the beam. Does it make sense? This reinforcing bars, they are there to take the tension. And they're gonna be taking the tension when the concrete is gonna be cracked. Before the concrete cracks, the three bars are not activated. They're not triggered yet. Nothing is happening to them. They see very little amount of strain and stress. Now, once the concrete is gonna be losing the stress or the strength here in tension, the three bars are gonna start to be triggered. They're gonna start to take some tension load and the beam is gonna be surviving. So this, the entire slide set here, it says it's about uncracked concrete performance, which means if I show you here rebars and I'm talking about uncracked concrete, which means before cracking, before the beam reach this intention, you can just disregard this AS. It's not doing anything to me. Should I repeat? Yes, please. Okay. So let's talk about this again. Based on this calculation, I did quick analysis, right? And then I said for the 4,000 PSI concrete, What's gonna happen? Tensile stress, which is this FCR equals 475 PSI. What does it mean by that? It means for this type of concrete, right? Concrete is gonna be uncracked as long as the tensile stress at the bottom is gonna be below this limit. So actually the code here, it gives me a limit. Right? The code here gives me a limit, right? Based on this 4,000 concrete, what's gonna happen? As long as the stress at the bottom is gonna be lower than 475, concrete is uncracked. And in this case, I can consider this to be uncracked beam, right? And the, the reinforcement's not activated yet, right? Yeah, the reinforcement now, they don't take anything because the concrete is still solid here. The reinforcing bars is gonna to start to work with us once this area here is gonna be full of cracks. And once we're gonna be going beyond this stress at the bottom, now the steel is gonna to start to work. Before that, the steel is working the same as concrete. I mean, there is no difference here between steel and concrete. When you put it there and there is no cracks, so it's gonna be exactly the same as concrete. It takes the same stress as the concrete. So you can just ignore it. You can ignore the fact that steel is much stronger than tension because the entire concrete is still working there. Make sense now? Yes. 
Okay. So once the stress at the bottom is going to be going beyond 475, the cracks is going to open, and then the rebar is going to get activated. Now the rebar is going to start to work. Just imagine two people next to each other, and they have load coming from the top. One is very strong, the other one is not as strong. Now we start to apply the load from the top. The load is gonna be very small. So both of them are able to support the same load. Once the load is gonna go to a certain point, now the weak person or the weak material is not gonna be able to take it anymore, right? It's gonna collapse. And then the strong material is gonna be able to support the entire thing. Okay. Thank you. No problem. So I'm gonna say, so what's gonna happen? I'm gonna say, here's the elastic analysis, it's the flexure formula. We just hear about the flexure formula. We hear about this compression and tension, right? Now we see it. Now I guess we are able here to connect between strength of materials and between concrete design. I remember this Y, I remember this C, you remember this H over two, what did you call it? C lower case, right? Which is the same as this H over two for this height. And JD is what you call what? That was the eight inch, right? This gave be the distance from tension to compression, but we use the same C and T, correct? And how much is the moment in this case? The moment is gonna be equal to C or T times JD. How about the stress distribution? Well, it's equal to this sigma, just, you know, it's just sigma, but just because uh, uh, copy and paste is not very clear, the picture is not that great. So this sigma is gonna be equal to the moment divided by the moment of inertia. This is gonna be the moment means bending moment divided by moment of inertia, multiplied by y, which is this from here to there. If you like to get here to the maximum stress, instead of this y, what you need to do is to use c, lower case. And what is c? Let's give it the distance from here to there. If you have any question on this, or if you like to review it more, go back to the slide set, right? From the trends of materials, they posted already and just read it there. It should be very useful to you now at this point. Now this is gonna make sense for you. Now, before the concrete start to crack, this is gonna be the performance of the concrete. It's gonna be like any homogeneous material. And the steel can be just ignored. So I'm gonna say before cracking, steel is ignored. I'm gonna put this here, before cracking, Reinforcing or rebars can be ignored. Any questions on this or we are good about it? Good. Right before cracking. Once the concrete is going to start crack, no, you cannot ignore them because they're going to be there. They're going to be taking all the tension force and concrete cannot take any tension force in this case. Now, someone's gonna say, how about the moment of inertia? We keep on talking about moment of inertia and I have seen it only once. I'm gonna say, yes, here's the moment of inertia. I have seen this before. Did you guys see this before? Yes, I've seen it also in the previous slide set. Then what? I'm gonna say, how about if you have a T-section? Is there a way to do the moment of inertia? Yes, here it is. You guys remember this equation? In statics, I want you to go back and review it quick. Yes. Just have an idea how to find out the moment of inertia for a section like this, right? Now, neutral axis is not going to be in the mid center, in the mid height. It's going to be shifted towards the flange. You see this? It's going to be shifted up. I understand. And the stress, let's say in the top is going to be compression, the bottom is going to be tension. And then we need to have an equation to figure out this tension compression. Here's the equation. So what is Y top in this case? Someone's gonna say, where is this Y top? I'm gonna say Y top, if you like definitions, gonna be from here. Distance from neutral axis to top fibers. You say from here to there, right? From here, top fibers to here. This is gonna be Y top. What is Y bottom? Y bottom is gonna be from here to there. Which is the same as C, but if you like to call this C, it's gonna be for the compression and for the tension, actually there is no name for it. This is a thing. I guess um, we should be good for today. And please, I want you to read this, understand it. So next time we can go through the rest of the slide set. 
try to understand it more and see how can we use this tension compression to find out the moment, which is very similar to what we have done in the principal material slide set. So we have here also two methods, just so you know. I'm gonna run you here through this so that you know. Look at this. The internal cobble method. What's the internal cobble method? It means that you're gonna have tension compression, right? This gonna be internal cobble method, which is a force method. Or you can use a flexure formula. What is the flexure formula? I'm gonna say flexure formula is gonna be this guy here, right? The flexure formula. So we're gonna repeat exactly what we have learned in transfer materials. We're gonna repeat it here in concrete and not just any concrete. It's gonna be uncracked concrete. Concrete before cracking. Yes, you need, of course, to calculate neutral axis, Venus. This is correct. You need to find out the location of it. Absolutely. Okay, please go ahead and sign out, type your name, and uh, you can leave for the night. Thank you for the explanation, Professor. Have a good weekend. No, no problem. You too. Thank you. Professor, I have a quick Thank question. You. Yes, absolutely. Uh, for the uh, previous slide where you where you have the flexure formula, uh, where you copy and paste, um, is flexure M times Y yes. over the moment of inertia, or is it M times C? C is the same as Y. Y is like variable. Y can be any value. The maximum Y is equal to C. Okay. So if you like to look for the maximum stress, this is a stress here at this point. See here, the stress at this line here is equal to this segment. The maximum stress is given the top. And in this case, Y becomes C. Oh, okay. Thank you. No problem. Sarah, are you still there? You have any questions? Uh, yeah, I did, but I think I got it. Thank you, Professor. Okay, no uh, problem. Yeah, good night. You too. Okay.